Welcome back to the TT Podcast. This is part two with Sean Anderson. Now, if you've not listened to part one, stop, collaborate and listen. Go back in time and listen to part one because as we say in Northern Ireland, that's a cracker. Sean, so away from the bikes, obviously you've just said that the household is 100% bikes all the time, but you do have a day job. You, you, you work for a living. You're not lucky enough to be a, a, a factory rider, although... The amount of times you're going away this winter, it does sound like you're a fa- you're a factory rider. You've just reeled off how many before we started three three, three tests you've got. Yeah. So there's going to be no excuse this year. No, absolutely not. I mean, it, as, I mean, uh, you're you're really forgetting all the the really important tests, things like Croft at the start of the season yeah. in early April, where again those tropical conditions will come into play, like 100. percent And uh, but yeah, we, we've been very fortunate in that way that this season. It looks like last year was the first time I ever tested in Spain. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back to Spain because it seemed to work. We had a pretty good year last year. So, but yeah, there's always a question of, you know, professional versus amateur at the TT and the the level of the event. You know, it's it's a world-class level. I I always used it as, I I used to car share many moons ago when, when I was in much different work, line of work with a guy who couldn't get it. And uh, I was, he was a golfer for whatever reason. I, yeah. I, I, I don't really get, if you want to hit a ball, get a dog to bring it back to you yeah. or whatever. I, I, why <laughs> you chase it yourself? <laughs> I, I have no idea. But I, I said, like, he couldn't get it. And I said, but I, for two weeks of the year, I get to live a professional life. I've, and I get to go to the equivalent of Augusta or St. Yeah. Andrews. And I get to play against Rory McIlroy or Tiger Woods or whoever your heroes are. Because Hickman, Dunlop, Harrison, McGuinness, whoever mm-hmm. is there, they're they're with the best equipment, and whether you have that or don't have that is is irrelevant. The fact that you get to turn up on a level playing field and be able to, I said, could you, if you won the lottery tomorrow, could you make that happen? Could you go to Augusta, get the top twenty road ra- ra- golf players in the world, and be there and make them and play a tournament against them on on even footing? And he was like. All the money in the world wouldn't get you that. And mm-hmm. I said, well, I have the opportunity to do that for two weeks. But come the Monday morning after, when the TT blues, when you get back and there's 300 emails unanswered, <laughs> and you think, well, this time Saturday I was doing 192 down Solby, and I was crossing the line, and we were heading to the beer tent and all the rest. And <laughs> it has to be said, the motivation on the Monday morning after the TT is struggle. never quite there, <laughs> quite the same, you know. I, Probably shouldn't say that in case my boss is listening, but <laughs> at, the, at the same time, it's it's really really tough after that. I think it's excusable though. Yeah. After after going f- f- from such a high of two weeks of being essentially a rock star, yeah, you know, and then having to yeah go back to uh, to the day job. But what is the day job? What are you doing on a daily basis? So I mean, I've been very fortunate. I, as I say, before I started racing, as uh, graduated as a as an engineer for in in motorcycle design and, uh, and and technology. And it was a case of, I, I, I knew like bikes is my life and uh, I wanted to work in the industry. And by hook or by crook, I was gonna get there one way or the other. And uh, very fortunate that my day job now, I, I work for, for Royal Enfield mm-hmm. now in the UK. Previously, I, I worked, I had a short spell at Norton, the new Norton as it is, uh, now in, in Solihull. And before that, I was uh, with KTM out in Austria. So this is maybe one of the things that I lo- does give you a wee bit of um, wiggle room in terms of what you do. And also that Monday morning, a lot of the guys in, in the office are more interested. Like, Good TT, yeah. brilliant two weeks. Oh, I was so chuffed to see 130, this, that, and the other, inside the top 10, blah, 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 and all this. So you get a lot of that on the, on the Monday morning. But at the same time, uh, I, I get to go in and talk about bikes all day. Yeah. And then I come home to my wife and talk about bikes. <laughs> and then uh, I go to the TT and talk about bikes. So, yeah. You've got to love it. Yeah. You see, we, on our crib sheet, it said, obviously, you lived in Austria, <clears throat> which you previously had. Yeah. So how did the Austrians deal with that Northern Irish twang? <laughs> well, are, uh, are you fluent, Austrian? <laughs> definitely, definitely not. It's German. Ah. They speak German. Yeah, they, they speak yeah, German. They speak German. Yeah. 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 And, um... I, 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 wasted. I, I, wasted on this me. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. I, is this for the international <laughs> podcast? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the I, I picked up enough to to get by and live on, but 
thank, I'm very thankful, like, I think we all are, we're a bit spoiled in that way, that the international language of business is English. Yeah. You go to Austria and the Austrians want to talk to Italians for brakes or suspension, it's done in English. Uh, you go to China for components, it's done in English. You go to Japan for other components, it's done in English. So you're very lucky that way. One thing that did come up after a number of years away was my international English accent. <laughs> yeah, because uh, there was a lot more the over twang. pronunciation <laughs> and slowing down <laughs> the, the rhythm of, my, uh, of the way I spoke. <laughs> I, I don't know why, uh, because the Austrians in themselves, uh, particularly different regions of it, they... They're German to Hochdeutsch to, to, to like high German or and all the rest is a bit what Northern Irish dialect is to the English language. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of it, they sort of get it because they don't speak really like high German. But yeah, the, it did run into a few interesting <laughs> translation <laughs> scenarios. Yeah, but <laughs> so at KTM, what for people listening, for people that own KTMs, what? job or role did you have over those bikes so what part of sean anderson it was on those bikes when they were rolling off the production line um so at ktm i was a a, a project leader so in, in the r d so if you ride a, a duke 390 or an rc 390 not that we're plugging because i work for a different manufacturer mm -hmm. now so buy a royal enfield and um <laughs> And my, my job was the overall responsibility of technically delivering that bike so whether it was engine calibration, chassis setup, handling, this and other uh, manufacturing of parts, industrialization of the of the design from the industrial designer side. I had I had a team of engineers and, and technicians underneath me to, to deliver that. And so in that way, like I had the, the overall the buck stopped with me in terms of if it was late or had problems or this that and other, it was for me to crack the whip and push the guys, whether it was the suspension guys, the chassis guys, the, the parts panel, the, the bodywork guys and all that stuff. Now for, for Enfield, I, I'm a, I work as a concept engineer, so we work very early doors with new technologies. And um, most of the stuff that I actually do at Enfield, you will never see what I've done, only if we prove it out in terms of like feasibility, practicality and, and advantage then that will roll into their production engineering side of things. So it's only really very early advanced vehicle um, stuff that I work on at, at Enfield. You're trying to think outside the box there and just bring yeah. new stuff to the table. I, I mean, like in terms of it, we're, you know, uh, there's a big transition going on in the world with regards to EV mm -hmm. and and like uh, flexi fuels and these sorts of things. And I mean, we, we see it at the same time, like with the TT organizers in terms of like, if you stand still, you die. Um, the amount of changes that they go through, they were very early adapters for, for EV. They yeah. were probably too early in terms of like commercial viability and all the rest. But in terms of that, we, you're always trying to, to push something into what, what will be the next big thing or there's a, an interest and hopefully that will relay eventually into a production model that will be successful obviously for the business in itself. I just picked up on something there. You obviously mentioned the RC390 when you was at KTM and being obviously uh, the man, not just behind that, but you had to speak for anything, any of the problems and so on. Well, that's, see, I ran the RC390 Cup in British Championship, the one make series. So you're telling me all the problems I had was your fault. And that was the Gen 1 bike. So. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> you di you're digging deep in the filing cabinet here for the excuses. I was, I was well prepared, but no, I, I, I mean like... Uh, Good corporate but, answer. Yeah, yeah. So th that was through KTM UK, but um, I, th I think the, the time frame that you were working on it was <laughs> just before I had started to fix a lot of those issues. Not that there was any issues. So that's interesting enough because I have this conversation an awful lot. I do a lot of test riding, as you know. Um, everywhere I test all the proving grounds and private places, the majority of vehicles, nearly all vehicles I'm testing alongside, um, I'm on a normally aspirated machine. Is Everything is uh, electric powered. So can you tell us anything? Because everybody's, all us petrol heads are denying we're going to have uh, electric bikes taking over and racing. Well, I mean, I, I think racing will be always, is, is, is very niche, you know, in terms of like the numbers worldwide and all the rest. So I, I think it'll, there'll be a long line. I mean, this is purely speculative on my side. I'm, I'm looking into a glass ball like everybody else and, and hoping to see something. But in, 
I, I also think, you know, you've seen recently without getting into like uh, automotive uh, industrial podcasting here oh, and all let's this. Let's go down like, that road. Come on, let's do it. I know loads. You've seen a pushback from Toyota in terms of like EV and and the, there's an endless amount of uh, propaganda on 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 any of the socials with regards to you know child labour digging cobalt out of mines in Africa and this that and the other. I I think there will always be uh, a space in terms of like looking into the synthetic fuels. You see it at MotoGP now. I could imagine that we would eventually maybe see that trickle, trickle down into other formulas of racing. Oh, there's already talk with BSP. I, exactly. Yeah. So, and I could imagine at the same time, it, it wouldn't be out, outside the realms of the TT to do the same. Um, you know, we're all environmentally, as much as we're there burning fuel and tires and all the rest, yeah. we're trying to do it in an, in, an, in an environmentally sound way to do it. So that way, and, the big thing is like I'm I'm very very fortunate like with my job I I was I get to travel and experience some of the other cultures around the world of motorcycling cultures because we think motorcycling primarily as a Western like we're here talking about TT and all this mm -hmm. but the big numbers are Asia and South America mm -hmm. and all the rest and they have a much bigger motorcycle culture maybe it's not a sporting culture it, it's certainly developing into that and in, in certain aspects and all the rest and uh, you know. Earlier uh, last year, I was out in Colombia and South America, and I, I, don't, I don't really see them building a supercharger, you know, out in the hills of the Peru, mm -hmm. uh, of, of in Peru or in Colombia and all the rest. Those sorts of those sorts of markets will make sure that we're burning fossil fuels for quite a long time, and it'll be interesting to see how that develops one way or the other. But I, I think. The, that, the internal combustion engines here for quite a bit longer. So just to finish that off, you've obviously, from a personal side, you've raced TT Zero. Yes, yes. Positive or negative? Do you enjoy it or not? I, I very much did. I mean, it was I was involved with one of the universities. Uh, my Actually, the, the university that I graduated from, Kingston, had a bike, so I was involved with that. And then um, one of my alumni that also graduated from that after, he wanted to run in the TT Zero, he's, he was uh, with Jaguar Land Rover in their EV series and was interested in bikes and all the rest. So, I mean, it was definitely, they, they talk about in racing, like when 125s and 250s were a class of have and have nots. But I, I think, you know, the, the TT Zero was definitely a class of have yeah. and have nots out there. And uh, it was great to see other universities like Nottingham really step up mm. the game and, and chase. But when you're in the time of the Moto Scissors and the Mugens. And I have to say, people like they're they're very hard on, on harsh on the on the TT Zero. The the Mugens were probably the most technologically advanced bikes I've ever seen and will ever see around the Isle of Man. Mm. Uh, because we you know, we're primarily racing production bikes. And uh, in that as an exercise, especially from somebody who's in the industry from a technical standpoint, they were amazing pieces of kit. Where you stand with wins and one lap races and all the rest, that I, you can get weighed down too much in in like the the politics of of who's what records and all the rest. But I I I th personally think we we're we're missing something like that, and it because maybe the the event was burnt hard because we had so many pushback from a fan base that only wants to hear internal combustion engines run and all the rest. It might be to our detriment that we've gone from being an early adapter yeah. to being maybe late to the show because you know once burnt twice shy sort of situation but the, also the industry isn't quite ready it's just not there still but when it comes i'm sure it will come fast but we've got a we have got a, a series in in moto gp in moto e haven't we that that looks like it's promising and pushing forward year on year isn't it yeah i mean it's very interesting i, I mean the fact that it's not an open category like the way TT Zero was mm. always is a bit of a leveler from a, from a riding point of view. I, could you imagine something like that riding the TT to have every all the riders on a same bike yeah, with the same yeah. this that and the other? Well, I've said it before on on <clears throat> on normal machines, say normal, normally yeah. combusted or, or or electric, but it'd be incredible. Yeah, and to have something so different like that would be would be an, an absolutely different approach to anything we've ever seen, and. Uh, you know, it's not beyond the realms, but I'm sure there's all sorts of contracts and commercial topics and all the rest that would be hard to overcome. But it, it'll it'll maybe come in in time. 
before we finish with your TT twenty twenty four, completely off the topic, we've just had the um, the MotoGP test. Um, was it Sepang? I think. Um, I've not really asked anybody this, but how do we think Mark Marquez is going to go on on that UK? It's completely left field, but I'm, I'm interested to find out. Oh, what, what well, he'll be all right, think. won't he? Do you think he'll be able to win championship though? You would not. You would not. This is my opinion, of course. You wouldn't bet against him. You know, he, he may. He may. Uh, not struggle, but not quite be there at the beginning because yeah. you know obviously a lot of people, a lot of the riders have ridden with the same bike, same setup, and so on. He's on the best package, um, without doubt. He'll be competitive. He really will. Yeah, but to win the championship is a tough ask. It yeah. really is. The hardest thing I think that he will have to be is not Mark Marquez because yeah. I think yeah. the last two three years he's had to override every minute, every corner, every lap, and has cost himself that and now trying to step back to be like the package will actually carry you towards the front mm. and you yeah. just need to be a tiny bit of what you were it should should be enough but i i feel like when you've when you've had maybe not the best machinery and had problems to overcome getting out of that mindset of constantly overriding and then overriding and making mistakes that might be his downfall but at the same time i mean when he came as a rookie and won in his first mm -hmm. year, he was able to make some mistakes. But the level of consistency that's now required at the front is so tough oh, that yeah. that that space to try and relearn a different machine and learn something so different than having to ride override for that long, that that might catch him out. I think. So, as an engineer as well, what's our opinion on what we're seeing in MotoGP? Wings, spoilers, just is it has it gone too far? I, I don't really think you can go too far. I mean, the the problem is w where we're talking about is is it engineering, is, is it racing, or is it entertainment? Yeah. Because certainly from an entertainment point of view, people worrying about the front tire being point one bar too high and how you can't sit in a slipstream and all the rest. It's it hasn't been the most entertaining series in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. From an engineering point of view. You, you 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 can absolutely like it's it's engineering porn in yeah. terms of that so um i mean we see it starting to like slowly seep into the tt like the bikes the level of the bikes at the at the very front are on a different are like are right up there like the wings on the bmw and honda's also now coming with a different aero package for the new fire blade and all the rest whether we'll ever get to the idea of lowering devices and all the rest the the, the tt in itself in so many ways pushes the boundaries of technology but it's also an old school track that old school solutions solve yeah. a lot of the time yeah. so it, it's a complete like contradiction in in terms of, of itself of what what would be what could be and what it can, what it allows because you know it's that old sort of adage of wouldn't it be great to see what a formula one car or whatever could do well it'd be teetering like a like a seesaw over balaf and it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's just one of those sorts of things. It's like a, a Formula One car from 60, 80 years ago would be better suited yeah. because it has real suspension and this, that, and the other and all, and all these sorts of things. I actually had a really interesting discussion with uh, the Birchels over like a sidecar is, you know, it's, it's a race car minus one wheel. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like aero and what could be done there and all that, but at the same time, it's, it's road racing and, and like leaning in to having not mechanical grip, to having aero grip, and the ripples and bumps that could potentially upset the airflow around it, and all of a sudden, all that downforce and grip that you had might not be there. Yeah, it's the sort of thing that you could never, until the place is like, you know, absolutely like football pitch smooth. Like, yeah. um, you couldn't lean in and trust it. So, yeah, it's such a compromise of where you could find advantages and and really develop the the machinery around that end but at the same time it's such a challenge like from an engineering point of view to make it work and also have the trust and and be able to lean into that technology because the consequences are quite are pretty high yeah. i understand that side of it but but you know obviously you talked about the lower end devices now motor gp and so on um We've seen the new GS1300 road bike with the same thing coming up with traffic lights it can lower down for short leg riders and so on but Aero, you, you can do 60 mile an hour mass, maximum on UK roads, and that's quite fast compared to Europe and 70 on the motorway. I don't think you really need Aero for that. 
<laughs> no, but it, it, it sells bikes. People are like, oh, big shiny parts that are made out of carbon and all the rest. That, <laughs> that, that bling's hard to go past when you're walking yeah. past the showroom. So, Yeah, yeah, you're right. So let's look forward to TT 2024. We've already we've broke the 130 mark, which we're very proud of. Absolutely. This is, is no mean feat. What's what's the what's the target? What are the goals? What's the plan for for you? Well, in twenty four, we're 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 etching at 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 the bit at the moment in terms of start numbers because start numbers mean everything until yeah. you actually get there and then realize they mean nothing. <laughs> and it's where you finish, not where you start. Um, so that's that's an exciting time at the moment. Uh, plans are are slowly coming together. Uh, we we definitely be in the seated riders again. Um, I mean, we all. But this internal joke in the house that I'm probably one of the the faster riders, but like I'd definitely be the seated rider. But if you asked the man on the street or the guy in the paddock of the TT, name all twenty seated riders, they would probably get to that sort of like eighteen of them, and then be like that guy with the beard, the big guy, uh, <laughs> the doorman, yeah, 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 the, the, the Belfast doorman, um, he uh, the club last ah. week. <laughs> it's like the fastest rider that no one's ever heard of, and um, so it, it was. It's one of those sorts of things. Um, I mean, we'd not try and turn this into a cycling podcast, but I, well, let's I, do it. Come on. I, yeah. I know, I know. There's a, definitely a soft spot from one of you about that. Steve and, loved it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've, I, we've seen the pictures in the in the spandex and the lightroom. <laughs> <Exactly. and laughs> he made me, <laughs> so it was consensual. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hey, so what about what? Hold on, no, 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 let's go back to this cycling. Sorry, bit. sorry. Okay. There's a great, my, my wife read a book and she I told said, you about cycling, it's for them lazy kids that don't want to run. <laughs> she, uh, she read a book called Atomic Habits and, uh, yeah. and uh, it talks about like Team GB cycling coach and bringing in people to be like these marginal gains and trying to think and not have a goal mentality because yeah. a goal leaves you empty once you've fulfilled it, like, you see even like endless Olympic winners like Michael Phelps like had like issues after his Olympic career was over because you've you've reached your goal and you're 35 or whatever and now what do you do you have an emptiness yeah. so it's always like I think and I, I've tried to bring that in in terms of like well it's constant improvement so I mean without doubt we were 1721 so 1710 without being a goal is a, a a reason to try and improve too and find reasons to get that improvement how yeah. you find those marginal gains to to close that next gap because we would say in in terms of the tt we have the three aliens at, mm -hmm. at the top and when you look at their times they're really the only three that have done sub 17 round there the next ones you have like connor and hachi 17 zero on the button which is heartbreaking but you have that like from fourth till seventh gap that are in the 132 mark. Mm -hmm. And that's that's got to be like the next part to try a piece of the puzzle to try and like get there and be involved in that part of the race. And, you you know, you, you have your Johns, your Jamie Cowards, your Helliers and all the rest. And that that's within striking distance. It's a it's a 10, 10, 11 second gap from where I am at the minute. And that's less of a gap than where we were from my PB uh, previously to PB in 2023. Yeah. So that everything that I do, every early morning session in the gym or time on the bicycle or rowing, whatever, is in an aid or talk to the, the mechanics, the, 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 the team managers, the crew guys. Oh, I want to have this. I uh, want to have... My niece, like, uh, it comes down to like talking to the leather manufacturers. Last year, I saw pictures of like a flap of of leather up above the uh, my shoulder. Like when I was trying to get tucked in, I was like, "Can we get that? That it's out of the wind?" Because yeah. I, I, I'm already too big a seal trying to push through the wind as it is. All the, we won't talk about leathers and zips and stuff. <laughs> and um, it, it's, Don't get it's feel free. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's, it's the only time I've, I've really bumped into Steve <laughs> is when my zip exploded in 2023 <laughs> at yeah. Douglas Road Corner. And um, but all, all those sorts of like small marginal gains now at this stage. You know, when you look at it as 136 as as percentages, like nominal percentages to try and gain, you are like one two percent away mm. in this sector. One two percent there whether that's rider, whether it's equipment, whether it's everything. So all those things you have to try and like drill down on. I mean, there's still like overall in that time, 
especially to the, th the top three aliens, there's a, mass there's a massive gap. But trying to incrementally close those gaps to the next one, to the next one, yeah. that's, that's why I've, I've, I'm here and I'm, I'm still coming back year after year. Still work to be done. His wife was right, wasn't she? He's methodical. Very. It's not a thought process. Boring, I think you mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 honestly, I'm not. No. So if you could pick a, an ideal start number, where would you, where would you start? I mean... Based on who else is around you as well. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think we've seen, like, guys who were trying to make that jump, um, like Jamie got up at number four, and we saw it with Hillier in the past, that a low number and a year of learning because you're going to be caught and you're going to see things. Because there'll be a number of guys, and I, I, I'm, I'm quite friendly with, with a number of guys who are outside of the seated numbers because we came up together and, and just different friendships formed. The closer you get to the front, the further the riders are away from you because I never see Hickman or Dunlop or Dean because they're usually away, even in practice, in the first three or four bikes, and I might be bike seven or eight, even if we've pushed up, you know, got up early and all that. So you'd be better starting at number 40 on the road because Peter will probably catch you on his flying lap, and you'll see a bit. You might not see a lot because maybe your pace at number 50, it's not quite... It's yeah. a, it's not quite comparable, mm -hmm. but you'll see maybe something different. Whereas the closer you get to the front, especially the number of years that I was sort of like in the early 20s, so just outside of that seated run, you're outside of that block, you don't see the front guys and you you don't really see the back guys. You're in your own bubble, so your improvement has to come from yourself. So yeah. it's interesting to see, I mean, the the numbers that, that always sort of like pop up in, in your head is like Peter's an interesting one at 10 because everybody thinks, well, he's got a lot of traffic to deal with, but maybe he likes the chase that we talked mm -hmm. about earlier. You know, um, the earlier number, I think, for for certain guys that are trying to make that jump into the next stage, because you're going to be caught, you're going to see stuff that are there. So along, yeah. a lower number would be better. I mean, the the overthinking of my thought into this goes way, way beyond what we, keep, what we could capture today <laughs> in terms of, well, you're also like, the low numbers we sort of see, like you get more exposure, you're on the TV, mm -hmm. that means sponsorship, that means opportunities, those sorts of things all roll into each other. So you're all, I think in general, lower is better. And once you then have got to the pinnacle, I don't know, Steve, as, as somebody who's been at the very, very front, you can maybe say what it's like to actually have a preference to choose. But in terms of like both as a competitor to see what your comp other competitors are doing, lower is better whether you're caught getting away that level of exposure that all those sorts of things in terms of that all all would help so yeah i i, I wouldn't have a I, I don't have a favorite number inside that top 20 but uh lower is always better did you have a preference no not really i think you know the the only uh thing you were i was worried about should i say not you uh, i was worried about was being held up you know, uh, because you know as well as an obviously that how hard it is to pass even when you're on the same pace, how hard it is to pass safely. Yeah. Uh, especially on the faster set, or fa well, it's all fast around a TT course, but the faster set uh, over the mountain, you know, is so hard to get by, and it can cost you an awful lot of time. When we're seeing times now so close to to, to get on the podium and so on, so that was the only thing I was worried about in my short TT racing career as such. Um, but anyway, going back to what we said, obviously Chris moved on to. Uh, 2024. What is the situation? Who are you riding for? Is it your own thing? Is it a team? What? Who are you with? As it stands at the minute, we like the the team classic Suzuki. So Steve Wheatman and yep. uh, and Nathan, um, they were really happy with what we did last year. I mean, I think the Suzuki is quite a well proven bike, shall we say, at this stage, to be kind. And um, that I think there's still more potential. You know, I I, I make no bones about. It. I'm very and Iraq about the whole situation. So compared against the ideal, so the fastest ever Suzuki lap is Michael at 133.7. Where can I make time? Where is the difference between me as a rider and Michael as a rider? But given the same level of machinery on those two things, why is that time being lost and all the rest? Hopefully we're going to have a, a Honda Super Stalker. So it definitely seems to be the way forward, it's turning into a wee bit of a Honda Cup at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have the Honda and the BM is really the two strongest packages out there. So I, I was given an opportunity to sort of see what that's going to be like. I haven't ridden the bike yet, 
So it's the new one. Uh, it's the twenty. It's the previous model. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's not the new new one for twenty four. So uh, in that way, I'm I'm interested. I mean, I've been a bit of a a, a one trick pony in terms of Suzuki through most of my career. So it's also I guess a tentative dipping of the toe because. The Suzuki's there, we have the data, we've ridden it for since it basically came out in 17, that if we have a bad practice week, good old faithful's there, and there's still there's still a bit to go in it from my side and from, from in terms of the outright speed of what I can get out of that. But, you know, one thing about the TT is it, it never standing still. The machinery, you know, if you can have a 22 bike or a 23 bike or a 24 bike, you'll always pick the newest there. Yep. And it's a case of, well, we'll see if we gel with the new bike or with a, with a different manufacturer. And in doing that, it'll also be a step forward because that bike came three or four years after the Suzuki. So all those things have moved on, the, the electronics, the the way the chassis is, all those sorts of things. So trying to cover off all bases in terms of that. Oh, super sorry, mate, will you ride that in the Superbike then or will you ride the Suzuki Superbike and then Honda potentially stock? Um, the plan is that the, the Suzuki Superbike is, is set up with like all things quick change wheel and all the rest and the Honda is purely a stalker. Right. I, I I have no idea in terms of how it'll work out at the end of practice week. Um, there could be a difficult conversation mm. <laughs> to be had uh, there, but I think like there's still enough. I mean, the the TT is such a gamble. You know, we could have we could be sitting there with a bad practice week for whatever reason, mechanical issues and all this. And having that that sort of like well known card in your back pocket, just to pull out, just to yeah. be there, to be like, well, we have the satins from last year, we know it works. So how's that in the other? I don't know if it goes the other way, how it will work. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, it's still business, and um, I've made an agreement to ride the, the Suzuki in the two six lap races. Yeah. So, I, I I even hate thinking about it at the minute, but <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Oh yeah, rather you than me. Hopefully you won't need to. No. Steve, before you take the last sip of your water too late, um, Steve's quick fire questions are coming up right now. I, th I feel like we need a jingle for Steve's quick <coughs> fire questions now. A I jingle. think we're at that time. Steve's quick fire questions. Right, quick fire questions. You've listened to all the podcasts. You know the you know what you know what it is. You just oh. answer one or the other. No no excuses, no nothing. Beer or wine? Beer. Modern or classic bikes? Modern. Pineapple or never pineapple on a never. pizza? Get out, flip it out, tell you what. Time trial or mass start? Time trial. Orange or blue? Ooh. <laughs> Orange. Ooh. Cameron Donald or Michael Dunlop? Or Cam Donald. Ginger Hall to Ramsey or Ramsey to Bungalow? Ginger Hall to Ramsey. Northern Ireland or the Isle of Man? The Isle of Man. Washing or drying? <laughs> Washing. Pay for a factory TT ride or pay for the wife to go racing? <laughs> <laughs> In your own time. Um, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think we're out of time, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we've just got enough time for this. Um, <laughs> oh, think, think factory. <laughs> factory, good <laughs> lad. That's the answer I wanted. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel like we could have probably sat here and chatted another two or three hours about engineering and motorcycles. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thanks, mate. And good Thank luck. you very much. Yeah, good luck in 2024. Cheers. Steve, Sean Anderson has left the building. What do you... I mean, he's sat right there, so this is going to be hard to have a, an outro conversation about him. It's a cracker. <laughs> he's on door duty tonight. He had to shoot off quick. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. It should have been longer. <laughs> hey, what, what a fascinating chat, though. Do you know what? And he is still in the building, but I will say this. Like, I've, I started going to the TT in 2022 and saw Sean going up and down. And that's all I ever saw of him, like kind of going up and down the paddock. And you get a false impression of what someone's like because you only see them going up to, to war, in, in effect. So you see this real stern, intense character but then you actually sit down and chat with him and he's completely different. Yeah, 100%. And I'm great to hear he's mm. been doing some training and getting his head buried and getting fit this year because I was at Douglas Road Corner last year and he burst out of his leathers, bust a zip. So it's 
looking good. He's going to be a fit man this year. Was that a, was that a um, a mechanical or was that a uh, a rider error? Oh, I think it's too down. Many it's too many nights on the door. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but in all honesty, he's um, he's looking. He is looking in good shape. He's going to be looking in even in better shape come TT twenty twenty four. He's got a real shot of of a good result, a good solid top ten. Yeah, without doubt. You know, we've listened to how methodical he is. He thinks everything through massively, mm -hmm. and he's not trying to get too far in front of himself. Just trying to step forward and keep improving. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to see what he uh, what he does. Uh, he is still here, so he is looking at us. But give us a prediction. What do you think, senior TT race? Oh, that's a good question. Well, one thirty. Point three oh five seven three five seven three, five, last year, three, six, I believe. Seven, five, seven, yeah, seven, anyway, five, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere a, near there. We may as well call it 131. He'll just want to be getting faster, obviously, and just jump into that next step and targeting the people in front of him. So that's it for this episode of the TT Podcast. Now, I know you're watching on TT Plus, but if you could take a moment for us, head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating and a review because Steve really does love them. Now, next week will be something a little bit different because I'm heading back to the Isle of Man for the Road to 2024, the official launch of the TT races for 2024. And I cannot wait to get back to the island. So it'll be interesting to see what's going off over on the island. Steve, of course, is going to be there. So join us next week on TT Plus and find out how I get on. Now, if you want all the latest news and features, head over to iomttracers.com. If you want to check us out on socials, we're at TT Racers Official. But until then, au revoir, Steve. It's been a pleasure.